think we 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 can uh, we can start. So we we wait uh, just few. We have waited uh, just few minutes. Now it's time to to start. I would like to start welcoming our guest. Uh, thank you very much being uh, be with us. I am Mauro. I'm sales director of uh, GM International, and today I have the pleasure to be here with uh, with Bob. Bob is one of the most knowledge knowledgeable person I know in the matter of uh, intrinsic safety, hazardous area, and and uh, and um, such kind of uh, matter. And he is also. Uh, instructor, trainer for the IECX uh, uh, training program. Maybe you can uh, you can bet, better explain uh, Bob later. Sure. And uh, today we are here yeah, facing a topic uh, of uh, intrinsic safety uh, on, a, on a special, starting from a special angle. We, we start with the wall chart uh, uh, which I'm sure many of you has in uh, in the office, but uh, we have also as GMI World Charter, and together with Bob, we go through uh, this topic uh, topic today. Um, before to leave the speech to Bob, uh, I would like just to give you a short introduction of the company. GMI is an Italian company. We have a production site here in Italy. What we do, we do field interface. Uh, uh, for the uh, industrial packages like BCS, ESD, fire and gas, BMS, and so on, this kind of application where in the industrial sector like oil and gas, chemical, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, and so on and so on. We have 40 years experience in the matter and our product mainly touch two aspects of the safety. One, it is intrinsic safety, which is the matter uh, we will, uh, the topic we will discuss today with Bob. Uh, um, and the other one is functional safety. So we are talking about the seal. We are Italian, 100% production in Italy. On the other hand, we are present worldwide in all, uh, in all continent. Uh, yeah, this is just a few numbers showing up how the company uh, is, is prison worldwide. So we have offices, uh, we have a distributor worldwide where we have no subsidiary. We have a staff of 200 person, most of them dedicated to I say the, to the safety topic uh, and ready to support our customer. And we are running uh, several training because we like to share our knowledge as we are doing today. We share our knowledge through training. So we do functional safety training, AX training. And since last few months, uh, we started also with cybersecurity uh, training program. Uh, and of course, our instrumentation is uh, has a lot of installation worldwide. So since we deal with safety, with the human life, uh, with the environment, with the asset of the companies, uh, uh, of course, quality, it is something, uh, something very, very important. I'm not going to read all details because uh, you have the chance, you will receive the presentation later. You will have the chance uh, to watch this uh, these, uh, webinar. If you believe you miss some topic, uh, you, will, you can watch that on our, uh, and reach that on our um, YouTube channel. So don't, you have the chance to, 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 to review that uh, in future or to recommend that uh, to your colleagues. Of course, uh, being, uh, being worldwide present, uh, we have uh, uh, all the necessary certification to, to, to certify the quality of the production, the engineering and so on, as well all certification required to be installed uh, worldwide in Russia, in Brazil, uh, in the Middle East, and so on and so on. So any 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 um, certification required, being international company like GMI, is uh, we have uh, we have all that certification available. So this is a short overview of the product. I I, I spoke about I said. Uh, field interface, so we have intrinsic safe barrier, we have safety relays, we have isolator, we have power supply systems, as well as a multiplexer, which are installed in uh, classified area zone one, up to zone one. 
Uh, we have termination board uh, specifically dedicated uh, to the many uh, DCS and ESD control systems. So we have uh, uh, this termination board tailored for specific systems. We have heart multiplexer as well as a surge protector and loop indicators. All these products either are safety related, either are intrinsic safety or a combination of these two, of these two aspects. As the last bullet was showing, not a product, but something that we promote, which is our, which are our functional safety training, which are our EX training and our cybersecurity training. Uh, this is just a short list of uh, our kind of customer. So, but I'm not going to 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 read the, to read all these customer, but it give you an idea of which kind of customer will be we deal with directly or indirectly. And then I think this was the last slide of the introduction, and uh, I'm ready now to um, to give the speech to Bob. Before to do that, I want just to say uh, you have the chance uh, uh, to raise question. Uh, there is a question box, so I will monitor that, and I will be ready to interrupt Bob uh, in case of a question is uh, is, uh, is is asked by you. And uh, yeah, that's all from my side at the moment. So Bob, all right. this is your time. All right, thank you, Mauro. Um, and yeah, thank you all very much for participating. Uh, right now it's, uh, it's around 12.15 uh, in the morning here in Houston. So if I'm a little bit dragging, I, I will apologize right now. It's been a long day, but uh, I'll do my best to try to power through here. So as, as Moro said, this is actually a presentation we've done a couple times. Um, some of you who had pre-registered had actually given us some questions and answers. So we actually have some of those at the very end. So if you did ask some questions, hopefully we threw those in as I tried to answer those at the, at the very end with the Q&A. But as Moro said, if you have a question as we're going along, please do ask it and we'll try to answer it as we do go along. So this was kind of a, a topic I, I picked up because, you know, when I when I go around to various places, um, I always see EX wall charts and every time I see them, I'm always kind of interested because, it, you know, there's a lot of different ones out there, lots of different companies, and organizations build them, put them together. Some of them are fantastic. Uh, some of them not so good, but, you know, they, they all have a lot of good information. And usually what I'll end up doing, I'll, I may ask the individual who I'm seeing, hey, tell me a little bit about the wall chart. And they usually look at it and go, well, I got it at a, at a presentation or I picked it up at a trade show or I did something or I requested it and I use it, but I don't really know everything on there. So I figured, well, why not have a, you know, have a quick webinar on all the relevant information, how you can use these wall charts. Um, one thing about wall charts, you know, as soon as they get printed, they are out of date <laughs> because the standards do change. So do make make yourself aware that, you know, if you have a wall chart and if it's probably more than three, four or five years old, it's probably time to get a new one. And certainly GMI has a fantastic wall chart and we'd be happy to get you one um, uh, and just let us know. We'll be happy to send some out at the end of the, uh, the webinar here. So here's an example of the GMI wall chart. I, I realize it's very small. So we're gonna zoom in on a couple of different areas of the wall chart to, to hopefully explain some of this stuff. So when you do get it on the wall and somebody comes and asks you questions, you can answer those clearly and concisely. So they are to help you understand hazardous locations. And there's a lot of information on here. So we'll just kind of go through it here. So on the, on the top left corner on this wall chart, but you'll see this on many different wall charts is area classification. And this is really the first step that you take when you're, when you're dealing with hazardous locations is obviously we need to know the area of uh, hazard that we're dealing with. And it could be uh, a gas hazard or it could be a dust hazard, could be a combination. So the relevant standards, if you will, within the IEC world, are the 60079-10-1 for gases and vapors and 10-2 for dust. And by the way, you'll see reference to 60079 
all throughout the wall charts, no matter whose wall chart you're looking at, because those are the relevant IEC or EN standards that deal with hazardous locations. So just remember 10-1 is gases and vapors, 10-2 is dust. And that basically, that document there tells us how to classify. And, and the reason or how we classify it, if we say it, if we look at our definitions, and I'll see if I can actually annotate this here a little bit, but we see, for example, a definition right here, a very high two independent means, a place where an explosive atmosphere is frequent or for long or continuously present. So we typically consider that for, uh, for area classification, either a zone zero or a zone 20 for dust. And so we kind of go over here. This is our ATEX categories that we talk about. You'll hear that term before. And then sometimes if you're dealing in the IEC EX, you'll hear about what is called EPL uh, or equipment or explosion protection level. So this information here is kind of important. We basically talk about either a, a, a definition is typically continuous, present, long period of time, a place where an explosive atmosphere is occasionally present, we typically consider that to be a zone one, and something in which it's not present during normal operation, but could be for short periods, we typically classify that as zone two. So generally speaking, for gas atmospheres, it's either going to be a zone zero, zone one, or zone two. Uh, the vast majority of applications are going to be in zone one and zone two, not so much in zone zero, because that's an area typically left for, uh, as an example, inside of, say, a tank that might be used to house some sort of flammable liquid, if you will. So that's typically a zone zero environment. There are some other documents that are also used for area classification that you'll see. These aren't referenced on the wall chart, but there's what is called the Energy Institute IP15. It's a great document. It, is, it shows up in a lot of uh, client specifications, and it's a very, very robust and detailed document that people will use to do area classification. In the United States, we have what are called American Petroleum Institute recommend, recommended practices that also give you some good guidance. And we also have what is called an NFPA document that is also for area classification. So they're all variations on the same theme. We use a lot of the same terms, um, but basically this is what we're looking at. So remember this, if it's continuous, it's gonna be zone zero. If it's present occasionally during normal operation, typically it's gonna be zone one. And if it's not normally present, but it will be for very short periods of time, we would consider that to be a zone two environment. So going into our next slide, I've already kind of talked a little bit about this, but we talk about categories. If we get into the mining industry, we'll see things like M1 or M2. So that's when we start getting into coal mine applications. Basically under, under if you will, the ATEX directive, when we talk about group two, that's basically anything that we see on the surface. So anything that we see above ground is considered to be a group two. Anything below ground is considered to be a group one. So those are mining applications. We don't really get into that too terribly often, but that's, uh, that's what you will see. Then you'll see things like G or D. Uh, the G is for gas applications. The D is for dust. And you'll see this 1G, or in this case, GA. This is the requirement of markings under the ATEX directive. We'll have a 1G or a 2G or a 3G. Under the IEC EX, we have a GA, GB, or GC. And basically the 1G and the GA more or less mean the same thing, if you will. So that's what you will typically find with some of the markings and some of the, uh, the requirements as far as uh, area classification. Now protection levels, this is when we start talking about protection or the equipment that we're gonna put into areas uh, that are either present continuously like a zone zero or normally so forth and so on. 
two, or we should say here, very high protection level, which means that we have two independent means of protection, which means that we could have two independent faults, but that piece of equipment would still operate safely in a zone zero environment. So one of the protection concepts that we actually use for zone zero, which is commonly used, is intrinsic safety. And intrinsic safety, a barrier will actually have two, uh, will have, it will have actually redundancy built in to handle that two independent fault requirement. So when we talk about equipment that we're gonna put into the most onerous area, that equipment has to be built with redundancy and that's what we're talking about. Now, when we start talking a little bit about North American applications, and some of you may run into this, if you see some US engineering firm or US oil and gas company, <coughs> excuse me, we have what are called classes and divisions. And basically classes and divisions pretty much mean the same thing as what we find in the international community. Um, a division one area is an area in which a flammable gas air mixture exists under normal operation. Division two is an area exists under abnormal operation. So you can kind of think of it this way. Division two is very similar in concept to a zone two. Uh, division one is actually more or less a combination of zone zero and zone one. So we kind of have it grouped together, if you will, for division one applications. Uh, in the US, we would actually classify the inside of a tank as a division one area, as opposed to in the international community, we would say that's typically a zone zero environment. Then we subdivide class one is all gases and vapors, class two are dusts, and class three are fibers and flimes. So now you know a little bit about the North American methodology. This is all referenced within what is called the National Electric Code, the NEC. Um, so now let's do a little poll question here. Let me see. Yes. If we, I launched the, um, the poll. So we, are, we ask you to, to give your feedback, eh, to interact a little bit with, uh, with us and to provide your, your idea, your answer to these uh, simple questions. So don't be shy. And, so and have... we won't know who voted for what, so it's okay. We, uh, you know, take your best guess. So what is the question here? Uh, what would be the definition of zone one hazardous environment? Uh, okay, per 679-1. So answer A is where that hazardous gas or vapor is present can frequency, frequently or continuously. Uh, B is where it exists during normal operations. C is where it exists not often in normal operations, but if it does occur, it occurs infrequently. And then finally D, where place where dust hazard atmosphere is present occasionally during normal operations. Okay, so okay. we just wait a few, few clicks again, and then we uh, stop the poll. See okay. how you guys did. Yeah, so I will stop the poll, and I will also share the result. Okay. And yeah, the majority of you guys got the right answer, and the correct answer is B. So okay. it is where a gas vapor hazardous atmosphere is present occasionally during normal operations. That's what we would consider to be a zone one environment. The reason why D is not uh, the correct answer is dust hazards. And so what that would actually be not a zone one area, but it would actually be a zone 21 area. So good job, well done. Thanks for paying attention. There we go. So when we talk about gases and dusts uh, and vapors, we then further subdivide these gases uh, and dust and vapors on various um, uh, criteria. One of the criteria is what is called the minimum ignition energy, or we call that the MIE, or the explosive pressures, the MESG, and then also the explosive range, the LEL and the UEL, that's the lower explosive limit and the upper explosive limit. So 
in the international community, we say groups C, those are the most onerous. That's gases like hydrogen and acetylene. Group B gases are gases uh, like ethylene, for example. And group A gases are considered to be things like propane. Now, all gases and vapors will be, will be put in those groups if they're a flammable gas air mixture or a flammable gas mixture. Uh, in the US, we actually do it just the opposite. We say acetylene is its own group, group A, which is the most onerous. Group B is hydrogen and then C and D. So the important thing to remember about this with gas groupings, if you will, from a gas standpoint, if we have a product that is suitable for group 2C gases, that means it's actually good for all gas groups, okay? If it's only marked, say, group 2B, that means it's good for gases that contain, that might represent ethylene and propane, but would not be suitable for hydrogen atmospheres or acetylene atmospheres. So we start to divide these gases based upon these factors, uh, the volatility, the lower explosive limit, the upper explosive limit, the pressures. And so we try to come up with uh, uh, properties of these gases. So therefore, when we start selecting EX equipment, uh, we select them that will be safe. That's basically what we want to do. Now, the other thing you'll see on these wall charts is things, and this isn't really an EX concept, but we do reference what are called ingress protection or what you might call international protection codes. This is actually out of the IEC 60529 standard. So the important thing to remember about this is that these digits reflect um, the ingress of either a solid or a water. So generally speaking, the higher the numbers, the higher level of protection. So on the, on the, if you saw something that was marked IP say 54, that means it was dust protected and it's protected against splashing water. If we had something that was say IP 66, that means it was dust tight and it was also protected against powerful jetting. So generally speaking, with one exception, we can make the assumption that anything that is marked with a higher IP code can be used in environments with lower IP code requirements. For example, we can use an IP66 product in an environment in which IP54 is the minimum requirement because IP66 is a higher level of protection. There is one exception to that rule, however, IP67 is a temporary immersion where IP66 is powerful jetting. Actually, IP66 is a more onerous test than IP67. It's easier to achieve IP67 than it is IP66. So that's one area in which you just want to be careful about when you're selecting EX equipment to make sure that if a, if a project requires IP66, we make sure that we get a product that's marked IP66 and don't assume that a product that is IP67 is going to be suitable for that environment. Now, temperature codes is an area in which a lot of people really get confused about. So I'll try to hopefully explain this in such a way that will make sense. But basically, we have in the international community, we have six temperature codes ranging from T6 to T1. In the United States, we also have what are called intermediate temperature codes, but most of you don't see those. So I'm gonna assume you probably won't see those in your normal, uh, normal walkabouts, if you will. But T6 basically means that a product, if a product is marked T6, that means that that product will never exceed at its relevant surface temperature of 85 degrees C. If a product is marked T4, that means that that product will never exceed 135 degrees C. So when we see on the right-hand side, you'll see some gases over there. And you'll see, for example, ethyl ester, right? And I'll use this, hopefully I can write on here and you can see this. So ethyl ester, east ester, ethyl ester is, has an ignition temperature of 175 degrees C. We consider that to be a T4 gas. 
And that means that we can have a product that if it's a product is rated for T4, that's never going to exceed 135 degrees C. Well, guess what? This will not ignite unless this product got to 175 degrees C or hotter. So as long as we use a product that's rated T4 for an environment in which ethyl ester is being used, the product will never get hot enough to ignite that gas. So when you see things, gases and vapors will have, and they'll be assigned into temperature codes to them. And you can use a product that matches to the T code. The important thing to remember here is that if we had a product that had a T3 rating and we wanted to use it in an environment in which ethyl ester was present, T3 means that the product has a, an ignition temperature or an operating temperature of something close to or below 200 degrees C. If we put that product into an environment in which T4 is the gas, in this case, 175 degrees C, that's a no-go. We cannot do that. So it's important to understand when we're selecting products to pay attention to these T codes Realize this, a T6 product can basically go into any environment from a temperature code standpoint. A T1 product can only go into an environment in which T1 are the gases that are present. Hopefully that makes sense. But T codes always confuse people um, and it's easy to get confused. But if you can remember the six T codes, and basically what they mean, and then how the products and the, and the gases and vapors, how they intermix or how they intermix or how they uh, relate to each other and keep that in mind, that will help you with regards to selecting a VX equipment. Okay. Now we have another T or a, a T code question. Yes, we have a T code question. <laughs> and this I is kind of tough. Yeah, this is kind of tough because you don't see the uh, the chart right in front of you. <laughs> yeah, so you 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 can uh, I can imagine uh, you you can all at least bet right now, but in the future you may think about to have the world chart available with you, or when when you deal with uh, with uh, such issues. So let me give you a hint here. So T six is telling us that the the, the temperature will never exceed 85 degrees C. T5 is telling us that that product will never exceed 100 degrees C. If it's a T4 product, it will never exceed 135 degrees C. If it's a T3 product, it will never exceed 200 degrees C. And if it's a T2 product, it will never exceed 300 degrees C. So if you remember what I just told you right there and look at the question, and by the way, this question here is actually one of the questions that you would find on an IECEX COPC competency exam. So there you go. So, so what we're saying here is that this product will never exceed 125 degrees C. What would we mark this product? Just wait a few clicks again. So don't be shy. We wait just a few seconds again, and then we stop the poll and we share the result. I think we can stop now. And I share the result with all. Yep. So some of you guys said T5. Okay. So T5 is actually telling us that the relevant surface temperature of our product will never exceed 100 degrees C. In this case, our product is 125 degrees C, which is hotter than T5. So therefore the correct answer would have been T4 because T4 represents products up to 135 degrees C, something between 100 and 135. So the correct answer would have been T4. Good, good. So I'll okay. start. There you go. And then we can proceed, yeah. So, I won't, I, you know, as Moro even mentioned a little bit about reading everything on here, but I won't read everything on here, but I just kind of want to emphasize a couple things here. The EX protection concepts, there are really four main categories for gases and vapor hazards. If we talk about EX uh, equipment, 
and a lot of people use the term explosion proof or explosion protected. Um, there's a bunch of different protection concepts. And what you see there on the, on the right hand side, you think, see things like intrinsic safety or increased safety or pressurization. So we basically divide them up into categories depending on how they're dealing with uh, uh, energy or, or what is the protection concept. So intrinsic safety is limiting the amount of energy. Non-sparking, meaning that we're removing any sparking, that's typically referred to as, or increased safety is a typical concept. Containing an explosion uh, is actually flame-proof. We contain an explosion within inside of a flame-proof enclosure. And separation, removing a flammable gas air mixture from the inside of where the ignition sources could be, we could be doing that via pressurization. For dust hazards, we basically have energy limitation again and separation. So the protection concepts, if you will, if you look on the chart on the right-hand side, you'll see there's a list there of starting with 60079-11 and it goes down through. Those are the various protection concept standards. So if you wanted to know everything you wanted to know about intrinsic safety, you would pick up the 60079-11 standard and that would tell you how to build an intrinsically safe device. It doesn't tell you how to apply it, but it tells you how to build it. So when GMI manufactures a barrier, they have to build it to that relevant standard. Same thing as we continue on. So the important thing to note, those standards are great to know, but they're not necessarily, unless you're building EX equipment, really those aren't necessarily that helpful, if you will. There are some other IEC standards that are a little bit more helpful as far as for the design and the installation. But uh, that's what those standards are all about. So just give you a little bit of, uh, briefly, a little bit of about how we, how we build these things or what it is. So energy limitation, I mentioned that MIE, that's that minimum ignition energy. So intrinsically safe barriers or relays, this is the concept that is used. We limit the amount of energy. Uh, we have three ranges depending on the fault tolerance. EXIA is considered to be a two fault tolerance barrier. An EXIB is a single fault tolerance product. And EXIC is a non-fault tolerant product. So EXIA products are suitable for zone zero, one and two, EXIB are suitable for one and two, and EXIC is only suitable for zone two. So non-sparking, a good example of this is increased safety. Again, we're eliminating the potential for a spark or arc to occur based upon the design of the equipment. And this is typically based upon the creepage and clearance requirements, the distance through air or through a surface between say two energized components. So this was typically known as EXE. It's actually now changed to what is called EXEB. And a lesser form of this EXNA is now known as EXEC. There were some changes to some of the markings um, and protection concepts that have actually been moved around within the 60079 standards. So non-sparking is a lesser form, if you will, of increased safety. Now flame-proof, again, it used to be known as EXD, but we now are marking it EXDB. There's also powder-filled and enclosed break. These are all protection concepts that are containing potential uh, explosive atmospheres on the inside of the product and they will cool off any hot flaming gas to make sure that it does not ignite the surrounding atmosphere. So this is the whole idea behind containment concepts. So these are very much mechanical protection concepts. Intrinsic safety is more of a true electrical concept, but containment is really more of a mechanical concept. And then finally, we get into separation. And we could do this either encapsulating something we can hermetically seal, we can pressurize, we can immerse it in oil, we can restrict breathing. And again, we're removing the ignition source from the explosive atmosphere. 
using one or more of those techniques. So I'm going to skip this slide because I think it'll make more sense if we just actually go into some examples here. Um, this one is a little bit difficult to understand, and uh, but if you can understand this, you can understand an awful lot. But basically, what you have here, and what I want to highlight, is that there's two lines here, if you will. Actually, this line right here is really the key one I want you to focus your attention on. So we have a Roman numeral two, three, then we have a one in a bracket, then we have a G, then we have EX, NA, and we have brackets, IA, GA, N bracket, 2C, T4, GC. In a nutshell, what that is telling us is that this is good for surface applications in which it's a category three, which is a zone two environment. However, it can, be, it can provide downstream protection into a zone zero environment, gas hazard, using EXNA protection concepts as the barrier itself, providing downstream protection using intrinsic safety into all gas groups in which T4 or better is required. So that was a mouthful. <laughs> and that's an awful lot of information to understand. Now, this is another way of putting that same information under the IECEX. This is our dust markings. This is our mining markings. This is our North American markings. But this string right here is basically the string that we were really focusing our attention on. And so if you can understand that, that's, that's brilliant. Um, we spend an awful lot of time doing a lot of that stuff in a lot of the training programs to truly understand the marking strings. Now, here's another example, and this is actually from a flameproof box. And this may make a little bit more sense. But what we have here is that this and this is telling us our ATEX markings. Actually, all of this information here is our ATEX markings. And this is our ATEX certificate. This is also part of our ATEX markings. So all of this is basically a requirement under ATEX. This right here is our protection concept. So it's EXDB, good for gas groups 2B plus hydrogen with a T5 and an EPL of GB. So it's telling us that it's a flame-proof product suitable for zone one for gas groups 2B plus H2 in an ambient of minus 20 to plus 55. Now that's our ATEX markings. This is our IECEX markings. Notice that this information up here and this information here is identical. If it was only IECEX, it wouldn't have any of this markings. It would only have this markings down here. But this information here is basically the same information as what we see right here. So I apologize, I'm making all kinds of messes on here. But that's an example of an enclosure that is flame proof that has both ATEX as well as IECEX approval, all in one unit. Good. I think now we're getting near the end. <laughs> now, this is a good, tough question. This is a tough question, yes. This is a very tough question. But Let this me. is also another example of a question that you would find on, on maybe one of the competency programs, so. And this is another uh, situation where the world chart, having the world chart together with you would help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now let's, let's check again here. If you if you remind uh, or if you've got and take note of some of the of the explanation that Bob gave uh, about the marking, uh, otherwise you can try to bet right now. Yep. And then uh, we we discuss with uh, with uh, with Bob again. But again, here the the use of the wall chart really would uh, would help a lot. Well, no doubt. Yeah, I'll give you a hint, right? So the EXDB is flame proof. 
So you can pretty much disregard D. So it is flame proof. There is also this marking right here, IA, which if you're familiar with intrinsic safety, that is a protection concept of intrinsic safety. And then there's some other stuff in there as well. But I think, I think that hopefully will give you at least an understanding. Okay, so just let me stop this, the poll and share it with, uh, with all. Okay. And yes, congratulations to the guys that answered that question correctly. I know some of you guys didn't answer it, that's okay. Um, but the correct answer is A. And the key word here, and sometimes people don't catch this, but associated apparatus is another term for intrinsic safety. So what this is basically telling us, if we can imagine what this product actually looks like. So this product is a flame-proof enclosure that actually has intrinsic safe barriers on the inside of the enclosure, if you will. So that would be the marking of a flame-proof box with intrinsically safe barriers located inside or intrinsically safe relays inside, which is providing protection downstream into a zone zero environment. That's what that means. So if you can understand that marking, uh, you're, you're, you're ahead of the game. Trust me on that. Now, we Good. won't cover this one, <laughs> but we want to put this up here as well because some people have seen this poster, and this is the Functional Safety Fundamentals course poster, a SIL wall chart. And this is very helpful. We're not going to cover that today, I promise you. So, but I did want to make you aware that we actually have two wall charts available and be happy to get both of those to you. Here's the important thing to know, right? Wall charts can be useful tools if you know how to use them, right? We zip through that in about 30 minutes and there's an awful lot of information on there and it can get confusing. But, but quiz yourself, right? Take a look at it. Don't just let it collect dust or, or do something. Um, keep sharp. And here's the thing I mentioned very early on, right? As soon as something gets published, generally it's almost always out of date. So make sure that the wall chart that you're using from whomever it is, uh, try to keep them up to date. Um, I mean, wall charts are fantastic and a lot of information is still valid, but there is a lot of information that does get changed. So the important things that I always try to emphasize in all of our training programs that we do um, remember, we're only as good as the weakest link. And so there's so many areas in which failure can take place with regards to EX that we have to do a really good job of making sure that we're on top of everything. And we don't want to be that weakest link. Now, with that, we do have some other things and Yes, we have now the question and answer. We collected the questions uh, during the registration phase and we are now, uh, Bob will share with us uh, we'll bring the that answer. Up. We'll give you the, the answer. And I, I want just to comment, Bob, but you have really <laughs> a special way to, to communicate the, and to make things easier. I mean, you, you touched the complicated topics which uh, in a way that uh, it's, it's easy. Now with, with your explanation and the world chart, I think everybody of us would be, uh, would face easier the, 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 the problem we, 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 we have to face time to time during our hard work. Thank time. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Let me see if I can share this with you now. Okay. Uh, is this the right one? I think it is. Let's see if this is it. So, yeah, we see. We see. Is that what you see? Mark? Yes, we see. Okay. We see. Let me add uh, before I forget uh, another topic. Uh, you will receive the presentation. You will see the email address. Uh, so, if you have later on uh, uh, questions or if you would like to have. Uh, and to receive the wall chart, uh, either the EX one uh, or the functional safety uh, one, you just drop me an email. I, I will be happy to 
to provide you this. Absolutely. Yeah, we just had a couple questions that came in and I wanted to make sure to try to answer them as best as possible. So one question that was asked, what EX concepts would be recommended to use specifically for lighting or for high power applications such as switch gear? Um, in general, okay, oops, I think a picture got lost, but anyway, in general, increased safety with supplemental protection would make the most sense from a selection price standpoint. Um, there was a picture of an LED floodlight over there, but it seemed to get lost for some reason. On switch gear, um, usually anything lower than a thousand volt AC, flame proof, uh, or pressurization are certainly good options to consider. Um, a lot of people, we every now and then people will say, hey, can we do intrinsic safety for high voltage applications? And, and remember that, that intrinsic safety is an energy limitation, right? So we're limiting to about one watt of power or less. So we really can't make motors intrinsically safe. We can't make, um, uh, <laughs> we can't make light fixtures for the most part intrinsically safe. We might use intrinsically safe as part of the design in certain realms of those products, but, but overall uh, with IS, we're really limited to, um, you know, four to 20 million instrumentation type circuits. But for power applications, uh, flame proof, pressurization, or in many cases, EXE type concepts, uh, combining protection concepts are certainly uh, all options. There's the light. <laughs> um, this was a question that came in, marking requirements. Have these changed or do alternative markings still exist? Um, and this does come up quite a bit actually. And you will see a lot of products in the marketplace will have, for example, uh, and I think I mentioned this, so I did mention this in the, in the presentation. You'll see a lot of, we used, to, we used to use all flame proof was basically just marked EXD. But now what we are doing based upon the latest edition of IEC 60079-0 from 2017, anything that was EXD is now gonna be marked EXDB. Uh, anything that was EXE is now gonna be marked EXEB. So as an example down here, here's a label of a product that you can see that's actually marked EXDB. Uh, and actually you find another little mark here, this C is for construction safety. That's actually a mechanical standard. So yes, you will find new markings on older products when they get updated. That doesn't mean that you have to take a product out of service if it was only marked EXD or EXE. It just means that if you're buying a new product nowadays and it comes in and it's marked EXD, it was probably produced sometime a couple of years ago and may have been sitting on a shelf somewhere. So generally speaking, all the manufacturers should have been using the latest marking requirements from uh, edition seven from 2017. What's the difference between ATEX and IECEX approvals? Um, and this is a question that comes up an awful lot. So ATEX approvals are mandatory for countries within the European Union. Uh, of course, in the UK, they're now part of Brexit. They have just changed and they have a new scheme that's different than ATEX. It's called UKCS or AS, I believe it is. Um, it's very similar to ATEX the requirement within the United Kingdom to actually have it certified to that scheme. The IECEX is approved for other countries around or is the basis for some specific country approvals, and it's all based upon the IEC 60079 standards. Uh, technically, the products have no different safety characteristics as they are built to the same standards. Here's the big thing. Uh, zone 2 equipment under ATEX can be self-declared by the manufacturer for suitability. Whereas under IEC EX, that's not allowed. So under IEC EX, everything has to be third party certified under the ATEX directive. Um, you have to have products certified for zone zero and zone one by what is called a notified body, but a manufacturer under zone two can make a self declaration that it's suitable for zone two. 
And again, the EX marking strings with the exception of categories, the EX and CE mark and EPLs are identical. So they're very, very similar. And you're seeing most products nowadays, they will be marked both ATEX and IECEX. And in some cases like GMI, they'll have North American markings, they'll have all different kinds of markings on there as well. Um, several types of EXE equipment must be housed in one enclosure for placement in zone two. What kind of explosion protection of the enclosure should be? So if we had a zone two uh, application, we could put a lot of that into an EXE type enclosure. We wouldn't necessarily have to use a flame proof box because the individual components actually have a certification in and of themselves. So for zone one applications, all the products would have to be suitable for zone one. If it was going into a zone two, then all the products would have to be suitable for installation in a zone two. So typically they're very similar, an EXE versus an EXNA type enclosure. They look, out, they look identical. Uh, it's basically the impact resistant test is a little bit more robust for the zone one EXE as opposed to an EXNA or now EXEC type enclosure. Uh, this is a question that comes up an awful lot. Can we install additional components inside of an EXE enclosure once it has come into service, specifically not like non heat producing components like say fiber optics? This is a great question and it comes up, comes up all the time. You know, we all understand that by putting something else inside of these enclosures, especially if it's not generating heat, and fiber optics is not really going to generate heat, um, from a practical standpoint, right? If we did that, are we going to create an ignition hazard by putting it on the inside of a flame proof box? Generally speaking, I would tell you no. However, Part of the requirements for flame proof boxes is that not only do we have to determine how much heat is generated, which would be negligible by putting a fiber optic patch panel in there, but we also have to be concerned with what is called pressure piling on the inside of the enclosure. Meaning that if we have an explosion on the inside of that box, how that explosion travels throughout the inside of that box and by putting obstructions like contactors, breakers, or a little whatever, that can change the path of the explosion on the inside of the box and can actually rupture the box, depending on the placement. That's why manufacturers always say, look, when you want to replace something on the inside of a D enclosure, you should be replacing it like for like. You shouldn't be replacing, adding, deleting something that's not on the original bill of material. The moment you start doing that, then it's your responsibility to take ownership. And you know what I would always tell people is go back to the manufacturer, ask them if you can do that, and then the manufacturer can give you, uh, give you uh, the answer. But generally speaking, that's probably what they're going to say. They're, they're not gonna wanna take on that liability. Uh, there's a special protection concept. I think we only have maybe one or two more questions. EXS, this doesn't come up very often. I was kind of surprised we had a question on this. Um, is it recognized within Europe as an EN standard? So EXS is a very unique standard. It's one of those standards in which I mentioned all those other protection concepts like containment, energy limitation, all of that good stuff. It doesn't really fall within any of those concepts. So say I'm a manufacturer and I'm building something that's very unique and it doesn't really fall within those protection concepts, but yet I want to get this certified for hazardous location. Or it could be a situation that maybe the environment in which it's going into is outside of the realm of normal EX equipment, maybe a high, high oxygen concentration, or maybe the temperature range is way high or way low, or maybe the pressure is significantly different than atmospheric pressure. Well, that's where this standard comes into play. So the IEC has developed this standard. It's been around a long time. However, Senelec has not adopted this as an EN standard. They have adopted it as a technical specification. 
So technically, it's not a standard that is something to be enforced or mandated within Europe. However, some countries have actually adopted it as a country specific standard. For example, in the UK, they have adopted it as BS IEC 60079-333. Other European countries have not. So you really need to check on where you're going if you ever wanted to use EXS as a protection concept. That's a very unique question. <laughs> Don't get that very often. Uh, I think the last one, humid and corrosive environment. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's important to understand when we're selecting EX equipment, understand not just gases and vapors and temperatures, but what's the corrosive environment, the humidity. Um, so on the right-hand side, you can actually see a cable gland going into an enclosure. And that picture was taken actually only after about three years of service. And what you're seeing there is the, uh, the enclosure is actually uh, sacrificing itself. It's acting as a sacrificial anode to the gland that's going into it. The picture in the middle is actually a motor that's running in a zone one area that that motor has already only been installed for about three years. So you can see that that's in pretty bad shape. And then, <coughs> excuse me, on the left-hand side, that's a light fixture in which a lot of uh, uh, stuff has accumulated on the inside of the light fixture. So it is important to take into account humidity, the environment, uh, all of that good stuff. And I think Mauro mentioned how you can get one and certainly just drop up a note or drop more of a note and we'll be happy to get you a GMI wall chart. Um, the other thing is we have all these webinars that are online. Uh, you can go to our YouTube page. So you can go and see previous webinars, but you can also visit the GMI website and register for new webinars. Um, during these last 18 months, I don't know how many webinars we've done, but we've done an awful lot on various topics. So there's an awful lot of information out there that you can, uh, you can watch. Um, we have them on all different kinds of topics that hopefully have been entertaining. Um, but there was a way I think all of us uh, at GMI were able to kind of uh, at least continue to interact with our customers during the, these difficult COVID times. Yeah. And uh, I think hopefully as time goes on, we'll, we'll continue to do them, maybe just not quite as often. But certainly make sure that you, you have an opportunity to check them out. And yeah, if there's we, some, yeah. we will continue to, to provide this kind of webinar on different topics. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we, we engage uh, Bob, uh, even if it is midnight, uh, he is always available. <laughs> To support us, uh, we are touching several topics. Uh, one, it is intrinsic safety, it is a Zardus area, and we get the support from Bob. We have also other topic on, uh, um, uh, on uh, functional safety. We have uh, application topics, uh, how to use a safety relay, how to select a safety relay. So we have application uh, specific topic. And recently we added also uh, cyber security, which is also a topic uh, of interest for uh, for our industrial uh, sector. So, as Bob was mentioning, you just follow up uh, uh, our website. Uh, we will continue. We started with the uh, with uh, with the during the COVID period, but we will continue to 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 be online and uh, to share our uh, knowledge. Uh, we have feedback from uh, participant. Uh, of appreciation of what we are uh, doing. So we will continue. Maybe we will slow down a little bit in the next months, but we will be, and again, if there is any topic or if you believe, uh, or you, if, you, if you want to check, if you miss a topic, you just go to our YouTube uh, channel and you can have access to the all recorded uh, webinar we have done uh, since the last uh, one year and a half. So that's uh, that's all we have. That's all we have. Uh, we have re in, in reality a very last question, but this is a, a, an easy question, much easier than the ones before. 
yeah we need we we like to yeah to to have your feedback uh, uh, even uh, if you want to drop uh, a comment uh, if you want to uh, to want if you want to recommend a topic that you would like to see covered uh, in one of the next webinar we are open uh, we are uh, available uh, to, to to listen to you uh, in the meantime okay i think we can uh, stop this uh, poll and I share it. Uh, I had no doubt uh, about the result, uh, of course, not because of me, but because of uh, Bob, uh, which I, I take again uh, the chance uh, to thank. What was easy for me to, to wake up uh, this morning at 6.30 to start at 7. It was much harder for him to, 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 to remain wake up uh, until midnight. Uh, no problem. I'm going to go home and go to sleep. And I'm starting my business day, and uh, you you deserve now to, to take some rest, uh, Bob. And thank you very much uh, to, to all of you uh, to being uh, with us from the beginning to the end. And uh, we look forward to meet you again in the, in the future. You, you will receive the presentation, so you will have uh, our uh, contact details. Again, drop us an email. We will support you. Great. So, thank you thank very you. much, Bob. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thanks to all Good again. Day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.